thank you very much. Uh, first of all, can I just check uh, that that's, that you can all see that all right? Yes, we can see your slide, bye. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for the um, invitation to this virtual COVID-19 meeting. And I'm here, as uh, Andrea said, to present our work on the local and systemic responses in uh, to SARS-CoV-2 in children and adults. Uh, now, in 2020, um, I my main focus was really being part of the Human Lung Cell Atlas and really trying to understand uh, the individual cell types present in the cells through single cell RNA sequencing. And we just published a paper um, where we presented the cell types in health um, compared to asthma in the adult lung. Um, and we're just getting organized uh, to extend this work and really look at the cell types over the lifetime. So that is in human development in, in fetal samples, but also in pediatric samples. And of course, at that point, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, and we then very quickly pivoted our sample collections uh, to start to look at COVID-19 patients. Um, and of course, um, as is extremely well known now, age is in fact the biggest risk factor for COVID-19. And of course, death rates are very high in the elderly, uh, and thankfully, very, very rare in children. And also in children, children um, are of course, also infected with SARS-CoV-2, uh, but rarely come to clinic. And so the um, logic of our study really was, if we can understand why children have um, uh, do not develop the severe disease, maybe this will give us some clues for clinical targets and treatment of COVID-19. So we set out to uh, collect a large number of samples from the disease cohort that's uh, summarized on this slide. Um, and um, first of all, I need to say a very big thank you to Marco Nicolich, who's our uh, collaborator at UCL, who's been collaborating uh, or interacting with his clinical uh, colleagues at a Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital and a number of other hospitals throughout London. And uh, through that work, we were able uh, to set up a cohort uh, that covered a large number of healthy children, uh, 30 that covered a number of different age ranges, and then a smaller cohort of adults as comparison, uh, but also a cohort of COVID-19 patients, uh, 19 children and 18 adults. And in both uh, patients group, we span the range of uh, from mild asymptomatic disease all the way to severe disease. And all the sample processing was done in London, primarily by Kaylee Warlock and Masahiro Yoshida. Um, and uh, now that we've moved on in the pandemic quite a lot, just to say uh, that the samples were collected in the first and the second wave of the pandemic in the UK, at which case, at which time these were still variant of the Wuhan strain and the Alpha and the Delta variant hadn't really uh, come into play yet. And um, the Omicron variant was certainly not there. So just um, as reference. Um, the study design that we set up is summarized in this slide here. So um, we took brushes from the nose, from the trachea, um, and also uh, from a small number in, in bronchi. We also uh, supplemented our study with a number of bronchial sample uh, from Sasha Misharan's lab in, uh, at Northwestern. Um, and for all of these, we did single cell dissociation and then uh, carried out 10x sequencing, five prime sequencing that allowed us to not only profile the transcriptome, but also look at TCR and BCR repertoires. At the same time, we were also keen to obtain blood so that we could really compare uh, the uh, progress of the infection in the nose compared to what was happening in the blood. All the blood was frozen and thawed and then pooled to again be analyzed by five prime 10x, but this time also uh, using antibodies uh, to surface molecules um, via SiteSeq, and again, also looking at uh, the BCR and TCRs. And of course, um, we uh, use this to then uh, look at airway and blood cell, uh, oops, blood cell cell types um, over childhood development um, to look at the dynamics and comparison um, between the local and systolemic response, but most importantly, really to understand what's different in children compared to adults. Um, so once we had collected this data set, um, uh, 
we ended up with quite a large uh, number of samples. In total, we collected about 200,000 airway cells and about 40,000 immune, immune cells that were airway resident and carried out a very careful cell type annotation work primarily done by Ni Huang in our lab. And um, coming from a cell atlasing point of view, we found all the previously described cell types, but also a couple of new variants that I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, we also, um, in the immune population, distinguished various uh, myeloid uh, as well as T and B lymphoid cell types, but really all the cell types we were expecting were found. And having our single cell data, we were also, of course, able to look at um, viral transcription and by and large found that it was uh, present in a range of epithelial cells, but most prominently in secretory cells, goblet cells, uh, uh, some ciliated cells, but also these cycling basal cells. And incidentally, all of this data is available on the Sanger-hosted COVID-19 cell atlas page. And here you can uh, browse the data through CellX gene, uh, but you can also download it. Um, and then coming back to this cell atlasing point, um, so one of the cell types we um, thought were actually very interesting are these so-called hillock cells of the airways, uh, simply because that is a cell type that's been described in some depth in mouse, but really not um, very extensively in humans at all. Um, the markers are carotene 6A and carotene 13. And interestingly, they seem to um, have their own developmental trajectory along this edge of the UMAP a representation of the single cell data here. Um, but as yet, we actually know relatively little about this and um, uh, you know, future study will have to address the actual anatomy of this cell type in humans. Um, but coming back to um, SARS-CoV-2, this is actually, as I said before, uh, the uh, cell types that were infected, um, mostly the epithelial cells. Um, but one thing that was very interesting was when we looked at the time from the positive PCR test to when our samples were taken, um, here indicated by the colors going from red very early on to green and then blue, we noticed that we really only detected reads in those patients where the sample interval was very short, whereas anything, um, any of these longer ones that are mostly in green and blue, uh, we found that clearly the infection had already been cleared and we could no longer detect uh, the virus. And I think that's also in keeping with other people with what other people have reported. Um, another cell type, um, though, that we found that was associated with infection was actually a, tr uh, a cell type that we call transit epithelial cells. Um, others have referred to similar cells as secretory to ciliated cells that sits in the UMAP between the secretory cluster here and the ciliated cluster on the right. Previously, when we had looked at our data, um, lung data, the secretory and the ciliated cells always formed very discrete and distinct clusters. But here, particularly in infection, we see this big fat bridge that connects the two. And there were two distinct population uh, that we call uh, transit epithelial one and two that come across here. And if we then look at the metadata, we found that especially um, this population 17, the transit epi ones are primarily found in COVID patients. And uh, in terms of their cell types, these um, cells show both secretory as well as ciliated markers. Um, and we believe that this cell type arises in response to the disease because, of course, the surface epithelial cells are the first ones to be infected and then presumably die um, as, as part of the infection. And then the body responds to regenerate these cells. And when we look at uh, the developmental trajectory within this um, uh, UMAP through uh, an RNA velocitor analysis, uh, we see that the differential trajectory goes here from the blue basal cell through a number of secretory uh, stages and then connects here to the ciliated cells. So these look like intermediates that are really regenerating the surface epithelium. Another interesting aspect uh, we saw is that some of these secretory, but also uh, the transit epithelial cells that were enriched in the COVID-19 populations 
express tau protectin, uh, which is a dimer of S100A8 and A9. And that was interesting because, of course, others had already shown that tau protectin is associated with severe disease, but that was really primarily looking at myeloid cells who produce this tau protectin. Whereas here in, in the, the airways, we very clearly see that as epithelial cells that co-express S100A9, as can be clearly seen here in the double staining. So, so that all really makes sense that, of course, it's the epithelial cells that are first infected. They then uh, produce some of these danger molecules and really have a role in initiating the infection. Looking at the data set as a whole, then, we wanted to know which are the pathways uh, that are most strongly induced. Uh, again, this is all still in the airway, either in the epithelial or in the immune populations, and that overall analysis revealed interferon alpha, gamma, and TNF-alpha signaling, as well as neutrophil migration, with TNF-alpha really showing the strongest changes. And what I'm showing here is, first of all, the adult from healthy uh, to COVID and then post-COVID samples, and similarly in the children um, from the pediatric healthy to then in red the COVID-19 and then uh, the post-COVID-19 children returning to a lower level again. But actually what was very interesting here already is that when we compare the light blue to uh, the light pink, you can see that in these healthy children, interferon alpha um, signaling was already higher than in the adults. And um, we see a similar um, thing happening in the immune cells where the induction was even stronger than in the epithelial cells. And we then uh, dug into that a bit more, making, of course, use of our single cell data sets so that we could really home in on the individual cell types that played a role here. And I'm now showing this data in a slightly different way. So not just saying, you know, what's the absolute expression, but really trying to compare children versus adults. So what I'm showing here is the difference in expression between pediatrics and adults, just in epithelial cells and just from healthy patients. And um, pink shows that expression is higher in pediatric. And what is already apparent is that for all these different signaling path pathways, it's generally quite pink. But in particular, um, the goblet inflammatory cells um, and uh, a, a number of um, other cell types have already got a pre-activated interferon alpha response. In contrast, then, in the course of the infection, um, actually children seem to um, have a less strong um, or, or the total upregulation of these uh, pathways is less high in children than in adults. But again, when we then home in on the immune cells, again, just looking at the healthy population, so prior to any infection, we see that there's much stronger interferon alpha, gamma, as well as TNF alpha signaling in these pediatric um, individuals. And in particular, um, that is produced by cells of the innate immune cells here, NK cells, NK T cells, neutrophils, um, but actually also T cells, which are some or one subset of T cell that is, of course, adaptive immunity. And then so in uh, pre-infected children, there's already an activation, but then upon infection in children, uh, the response that these cells can mount, in particular in um, monocytes, is even stronger than that in adults. And the reason uh, why we think this is very important is, of course, that um, others have already shown that SARS-CoV-2 is very, very sensitive to the presence of interferon. Um, so here, this was um, um, in a study by Luku Kamagi et al. Um, they set up in vitro cultures that they infected with either SARS or SARS-CoV-2, and they found um, good viral um, uh, uh, replication but the minute they added interferon, oops, excuse me, sir. Um, the minute they added interferon, that in, uh, viral growth was strongly repressed. Or again, here, if you just add the viruses by themselves, they both generate a lot of spike protein, but then the minute you add interferon, especially SARS-CoV-2 um, is inhibited very strongly. So the fact then that in these pediatric patients, we have this pre-activated interferon response, I think means that in children, the infection is cleared much more rapidly at a local level, probably often before it even can become systemic. <laughs> 
Um, now switching gears, uh, leaving the airways behind and looking at the blood. Again, um, we, we had a very substantial data set, um, I think with, with about 200,000 cells. And again, um, in this case, Rick Lindeboom did a great job doing a lot of the cell type annotations. Uh, we also had some site seek data, so surface protein data, and that was indeed very helpful to, for example, uh, you know, unambiguously distinguish the CD4 from the CD8 T cells and for us a number of other subpopulations. So from this data, again, um, we used um, an analysis taking all the metadata into account um, and then looked at the uh, statistic of, of using mixed linear models of certain cell types being enriched. And um, what is shown um, in uh, what we have here is um, a plot that shows the fold change in cell type proportions and the size of the dot shows you uh, the um, effectively a p-value, effectively a one minus uh, a p-value. Uh, so it's a local true sign rate. Um, and so now we can use this to really look at the differences. And what's apparent is that um, the biggest change in children um, here, healthy COVID and convalescent is really in this region here, where we have a strong upregulation of naive B cells, naive T, CD4, uh, uh, CD8, as well as CD4 cells. And that is really very different to what we see in adults, where instead we see a strong upregulation of the of cytotoxic responses here, different CD8 po uh, populations that are strongly upregulated, a very strong upregulation of, of plasma cells, although there's some in children, uh, but really uh, very much a cytotoxic response, whereas here uh, the naive cells are activated. And of course, that is really very much a reflection of the developmental changes that go on during childhood development. So here we now have the same analysis, but this time just looking at the healthy children. And of course, uh, what you can see here is that in uh, neonates, there um, are many naive cells and many uh, cells representing the innate immune system, whereas the adaptive branch um, with uh, uh, T cells and B cells and here plasma cells is very much underrepresented. And that then uh, changes over time. There are a couple of interesting things going on, particularly at the sort of age when um, kids go to nursery, for example, a lot of the adaptive immune cells really go up um, here for the B cells, for example. And then as um, the patient group gets older and older, you have this increase in cytotoxic responses in the elderly. So what we're seeing is that this in, that there's this notable change from innate to adaptive um, immunity, the switch that happens in, over childhood, and that this, um, this switch is really amplified during COVID-19, where in children we see an upregulation of innate and naive responses, whereas in adults we have those cytotoxic responses that predominate. Um, we've also been able to look at the immune repertoire. Now this is just any of the T cells, uh, um, in this case, or the B cells that we have in our sample, they're not selected uh, for COVID-19. And uh, this, measures the number of unique TCR uh, sequences over the total TCR sequences that we see. So when that value is to one, it means there's no clonal expansion and every uh, TCR is different. And of course, the neonates, that number is close to one, stays very high, but then um, reduces as the oops, uh, adaptive immune system matures, as you'd expect, as you'd expect. Um, and we see the same effect for B cells. Um, but not quite as pronounced. But uh, I mean, this, this is of course known, although maybe not shown specifically in, in a COVID cohort, but that in principle of course means that these children have a much greater diversity of T cells to choose from. And then of course, um, this diversity is then further enriched by the infection leading to the release of both naive T and naive B cells as I'd shown in the previous slide. Um, another aspect of the blood study that was really interesting is that for each of, um, or for a large number of the different cell types, we could identify specific interference stimulated subpopulation. So if we here look at these monocytes, for example, uh, CD38, 
um, sorry, not CD38, it's marked as 38, so monocytes here, um, they exist as part of uh, a cluster, but are really quite distinct from the cluster. So not all monocytes are activated, it is only a subset that presumably had to be in the right place and the right time to have this activation. When we look across the different uh, cell types that um, are activated, they all have, of course, their cell type specific markers, but in terms of the interference simulated genes that they, they express, they're actually very, very similar. Um, so what happens if we now just look at these interferon stimulated population comparing adults to children? And the difference is really quite dramatic. Whereas in adults, we see a massive upregulation in the COVID patients across all of these. In children, it is much, much less. Some of these are even um, depleted, but you know, they're, they're barely upregulated. Also, we see um, in adults, uh, this is something that happens really quickly after infection and then goes down, uh, whereas in children it's so low that actually we don't see that down regulation. But so these interferon uh, um, stimulated populations are most abundant um, in the first week of symptom onset. And we can then also go further and really compare within patient uh, the correlation between nasal interferon activation and blood interferon activation and what we see is that in the adults, um, an induced interferon response very strongly correlates with uh, these populations in the blood. In children, we see some, but much, much less of the correlation. And really, um, we again explain that in the same way that I um, already outlined a little while ago, that presumably because of the, uh, the more innate nature of the nasal airway or, or airway response in general, children are simply able to control the infection locally. It never gets expanded and there's not uh, this um, induction of inflammatory responses in the blood. Um, nevertheless, we wanted to understand in our patient population, we could in, in many cell types see the interferon responsive genes, but it was actually quite difficult to find the interferon genes themselves because they're expressed relatively lowly and therefore they often drop out in single cell data. But to dig into this a bit more deeply, we um, arranged all of our cohort by the percentage of interferon stimulated population in the PBMCs. And um, indeed, this correlated with an interferon stimulation in the nose. Um, and then we found actually that only the very top three patients at this end had any um, meaningful interferon expression at all. And it was really only this one patient here where we could see type one and type three interferon genes expressed. Um, and when we then uh, split that up further and look at the exact cell type that expresses these genes, it's actually only conventional dendritic cells of the nose um, and to a much lesser extent, plasma cytoid dendritic cells that make this interferon. And this was actually a, a very interesting patient because it was a, a baby that was born to a COVID positive mother was born, tested COVID negative, and then with a day or two converted to being COVID positive, and we were then able to take a sample really quickly. And so we might have just caught an incredibly early stage of the infection here that might not normally- Just giving uh, you the two minute from. warning. Great, thank you. Um, that would normally be much harder to detect. And um, one of the reasons I think this is interesting is because a lot of other blood studies have actually shown a depletion of dendritic cells in the blood, where, um, whereas we actually see that certainly in the nose, the conventional dendritic cells are one of the key mediators of the interferon response, as you'd expect. And actually with that, um, that brings me to the um, end of my presentation and just do um, a brief summary. One of the main differences between kids and adults is really this increased local interferon response through a lot of innate immune cells. That does not happen to the same extent in adults, which we believe then um, leads to um, a spread of infection and systemic induction of interferon producing population, in particular cytotoxic populations. In contrast, uh, the lymphocytes that are induced in kids tend to be naive population. And also uh, in these uh, lymphocytes, uh, 
there's much greater clonotype diversity than adults. So there are actually a large number of differences, mostly reflected of the underlying immune system that may explain the differences between kids and adults, which mostly reflect the switch from innate immunity to adaptive immunity. And then I'd just like to um, thank the very large number of people involved in this study, um, uh, Rick Lindeboom and Ni Huang um, in Sarah Teichmann's lab, and of course, everybody else in Sarah Teichmann's lab at the Wellcome Sanger Institute, Marco Nikolic's lab, and in particular, Masahiro and Kaylee, um, the great uh, support teams at Sanger and clinical teams at Great Ormond Stream, and uh, uh, Sasha Misharan and the NU script investigators. And of course, a very large numbers of funders because we sort of pulled a lot of funding streams together to make this happen. And uh, last but not least, the patients and their family who consented to have their samples taken. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mayer. Um, so I see that we have a, a question from Rodney Rothstein, uh, which I'm uh, bringing up to uh, Rodney. You should be able to. I think it's. I think it's okay. Thank yeah. you. That was an amazing talk. Um, I have. I have two questions. One is. One is um, about whether kids have this increased um, innate immunity because they're being exposed to more viruses that we've already seen as adults and they haven't. And so therefore they're basically having a, a huger, a bigger response to, um, to all kinds of viruses, not just SARS-CoV-2. What do you yeah. think of that idea? Um, I so we we looked into this long and hard because we also wanted to um, see what other infections there were that we might not have known about. Uh, so there were a number of infections that were tested clinically, and most of, pretty much all of those came negative. But we then used um, an, an algorithm called Kraken to align any non-human reads to microbial or viral genomes, and that allowed us to find. Uh, a couple of infections, but overall the detectable infections that we had were low. In other words, we don't have any evidence to support what you just said, but it's nevertheless a very reasonable hypothesis, I think, just that, you know, uh, these kids um, have these responses and um, because they they are exposed to things that they haven't seen before, but it's it's difficult to see how with the data at the moment we can go beyond speculation, really. Okay. And the other the other question was, um, I know you haven't looked at Omicron yet, but um, some the viruses when they um, when the when the different variants come out, they do change some of the um, the ORFs. Uh, a little bit and expression levels. And you said you actually had expression levels of some of the viral proteins. So yeah. did you see any change that was occurring? And I'm, my, what I was wondering is whether Omicron is being able to target um, innate immunity better and that makes kids get Omicron infections more, more often. Yeah, I mean, um, again, from the data we have, it's impossible to comment on because you know this was all done before Omicron was around. Uh, another, um, we we wanted to do five prime tag sequencing because we wanted to look at VDJ and BCR um, as part of the study. But one problem that causes us is that, of course, when we're reading from the five prime end, uh, the viral transcriptome at the three prime end is much greater, um, and so when we compare to some other three prime single cell studies, the total number of reads is slightly lower. And so we don't have quite the same depth as some other studies. Um, but, you know, it would be really interesting to uh, now continue to collect samples and then see where, whether we can tease down into those differences. But uh, to be honest, that it's not actually something that we are doing at the moment, because obviously also the, um, you know, doing these types of studies is very expensive, and I don't think we quite have the funding to continue doing this. Okay, thanks so much. Dr. Boyman, you have a question? Yes, thank you very much, Kerstin, for this beautiful talk. I had, uh, I, I was actually amazed to see how much, uh, how strong the interference signature 
by uh, those conventional dendritic cells were also compared to the plasma cytoid dendritic cells. And, and that was, if I understood correctly, in the nasal mucosa. Um, yes. would, that, would that maybe indicate that nasal vaccination and thereby targeting these type of dendritic cells would be a viable route that we should consider yeah. instead of sticking actually the vaccine inside a muscle which probably doesn't have many immune cells, shouldn't have many immune cells? Yeah. No, I, I very strongly agree with that. And actually in a completely different study that we've been doing um, in adult lung um, and adult lung and airways, we've been uh, sort of homing in on the IgA niche um, in the airways. And this is actually a bioarchive paper that's just come out, Madison et al. And, you know, we're really showing that um, IgA doesn't just get there by accident, but there's a specific immune niche that um, recruits IgA to the airways. And there are a number of different studies that have shown that IgA is more effective in neutralizing SARS-CoV-2 than IgG. And of course, we also know from, from bad experience that uh, whilst the current vaccines are extremely good at stopping severe disease, they're not very good at stopping spread of the virus. And certainly there are um, preliminary um, primate studies that suggest that nasal vaccines um, are actually better at also stopping um, spread of the virus. So I would very much agree with you that the, the next big vaccination round should really look into nasal delivery of vaccines because that's where the infection starts and that's where you really want to, um, you know, stop it before it can, you know, even get into the cells. Uh, but again, I mean, for that, we don't have any data on whether there's a difference between children or adults or anything like that. 